Hello, everybody. Today, just for fun, let's see how 538 did on their prediction for the 2024 election. So let's get right into it. This was last updated on November 5th. We'll look at the Senate and the House, but we're going to start at the top for president. And it does say they use polling, economic, and demographic data to explore likely election outcomes. I know they've gotten a lot of criticism over the years, but who hasn't? So in this simulation, they have Harris with the slightest of all advantages, 50 out of 100, 49 for Trump. Out of all 1,000 simulations, that's 500. 103 for Harris, 495 for Trump, and two have no winner. So that's extremely close. I don't really fault them for that. Yeah, Harris is favored just slightly more than Trump, but they're saying Trump is completely in this thing, 49 out of 100. That's essentially 50-50, which means anybody could win. And that's what a lot of people thought going in. That's what I thought, even though I did have Trump winning the Electoral College. So here's all 1,000 simulations. And the distribution here is pretty even, but it does look like in some of the more landslide scenarios, Harris does have a few more of those wins. So if we go down here, a little bit past the polling, we can see that in their final update, their model did slightly shift toward Harris on Monday the 4th. That was after some high-quality polls released over the weekend to show Harris tied or ahead in the key battlegrounds. They do mention that polls from more frequently polled but less well-regarded firms show a more Trump-leaning race but also moved in Harris's direction Monday. There was a lot of talk about Republican pollsters flooding the polling market and releasing favorable polls for Trump. I think that did happen, but a couple of things. First, it turns out that more of those polls were more accurate. And second, there was nothing stopping more Democratic-friendly pollsters from releasing polls that showed Harris also in the lead. They could have done it. Maybe they didn't do it because they didn't think she could win. Who knows? But ultimately, the polls did underestimate Trump yet again. Not as bad as 16 and 20. But still, in this close race, one or two points was the deciding factor. So they say all the seven battleground states are within the margin of error, so they're completely up for grabs by either side. So first, here we've got their timeline for their win probability. And back in late July, they had Trump slightly favored. And once Harris got into the race, she had that big honeymoon period. So she led for a few months. She even topped out at 64%. The final few weeks, though, saw it go back and forth. Trump had a lead, and then they settled on pretty much a tie, but Harris had a 1% lead. What about the popular vote? That actually did not change too much the entire campaign. Harris held a lead the entire time, and she finished with a 2.2% advantage. That, I don't think, is actually too unreasonable. That's actually close to what I was expecting. Trump winning the popular vote now seems like it makes sense, but before the election, it did not seem all that likely to happen. And with the electoral vote timeline, they finished with Harris having 270, Trump at 268, but it was back and forth in the weeks leading up. If that ended up happening where Harris won 270 to 268, I think there would have been a ton more chaos and unrest if that happened. So somebody was going to have to win by a convincing margin, and looks like Trump got that done. Now, what about the individual states? Well, in the blue wall, they had Harris favored in Wisconsin and Michigan. It was 50-50 in Pennsylvania, same in Nevada, while Trump was ahead in Arizona. Georgia and North Carolina. One of the biggest shockers, though, was New Jersey, and that they had 99 out of 100 for Harris. Given the wild swing in that state, the odds for Harris definitely should have been lower than 99. So what about these individual margins? Well, if we go down here, the closest state they had was actually Nevada, and that was tied in the popular vote. Trump ended up winning that by three points. Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, they had going to Harris slightly. They were wrong. Georgia, 1.1% for Trump, not too far off there. North Carolina, a bit of an underestimation for Trump, and certainly in Michigan, where they had Harris winning by 1.3. Arizona at 2 for Trump was also an underestimation. And the non-battleground states are all mostly the same story. Trump was underestimated. Sometimes it's by a little bit, sometimes it's by a lot. Florida and Texas come to mind as states that were a lot redder than expected. But also New York, Illinois, and especially in New Jersey. Now, given those states were not at all the battlegrounds, I don't think it's a huge deal. But on the flip side, these are supposed to be the pros who have a detailed model to predict close to what the final outcome is going to be. This is isn't just some random prediction on YouTube. They're supposed to know what they're doing. But as I frequently mention, everybody is just putting out their best guess and frequently just making stuff up. It's tough to gauge the exact kind of electorate that's going to turn out. And Election Day finally gives us those answers. So a lot of this is close to accurate. I'm not saying you shouldn't look at this at all. I think this is a good resource to get comprehensive data. It's easy to pile on somebody when they have the wrong result. So they should get some blame because they did underestimate Trump yet again. But it's all about keeping that blame proportional. So outside of president, how did they do in the U.S. Senate. Well, here they had Republicans winning control 92 times out of 100. Democrats were at 8. Not a big shock. Almost everybody predicted the GOP to take control. So let's scroll down here and see these results. But while we do, I had Republicans finishing with 52 seats. I happen to at least get all the calls right this time except for Pennsylvania. But a lot of that is pure luck when the margins are very narrow. So I've got plenty of misses, especially back in 2022. But again, these are supposed to be the pros. I'd like to think they're capable of doing a little bit better job than I can. So if we go all the way 
down here, the win probability for the GOP really opened up in the final few weeks of the election. They were already heavily favored throughout the election. But after Labor Day, when people started paying more attention and late breakers finally made their choice, that's when Republicans started to surge. So what about the individual states? They did have Ohio going to Marino by 1.2. That's an underestimation there, but I did the same thing. They clearly did overestimate the Democrats in the blue wall states. I'm not going to give them a hard time by saying Casey was going to win Pennsylvania, but they did have him up three points there and three and a half for Slotkin in Michigan, as well as Gallego up 3.8 in Arizona, although he did win. So a bit of an overestimation of support for the Dems there, but nothing too extreme. Rick Scott in Florida, though, they had him up five. And Scott pretty much blew it out of the water there. He vastly overperformed many expectations. Ted Cruz in Texas also overperformed this 5.1% margin they had. In Nevada, they had Jackie Rosen winning comfortably by five and a half. That race was much tighter there between her and Sam Brown. A lot of the rest of these were actually not too terrible. And considering that none of the rest of these were really in contention, I think they did a pretty good job considering these are wide margins and there's a ton of states. Now, not all of these are perfect. They did overestimate Kim in New Jersey, Schiff in California, Gillibrand in New York, also Banks in Indiana, and Warren in Massachusetts. But hey, if you're going to predict the margins across dozens of Senate seats, I think pretty much everybody's going to be off by five or ten on at least a few of these states. Some of these states just had very little attention and almost no polling. So it's easier to have a wider miss if you're going to win the state by 20 or 30 points. So that's the Senate. What about the U.S. House? Well, this one is another complete nail biter, but they did have the Democrats coming out on top 51 to 49. I don't think that's an unreasonable prediction. I thought it would be very close. And as we scroll down here, if I can brag about my own prediction, it might actually be Republicans 220 seats to 215 for the Dems. And that is actually exactly what I predicted. Of course, a bunch of the individual seats I got wrong, just like anybody else. But it does feel pretty good if I got the exact five seat Republican majority correct. So we'll keep scrolling down here a little bit past the map. And their final forecast had Democrats at 218 seats, Republicans at 217. That's not too far off from what I had, but they did have the Dems winning that majority. I will say with the success that Trump had at the top of the ticket, and similarly with the Republicans in the Senate, I think they probably should have gotten at least another five seats in their majority. So it turns out the potential silver lining for the Democrats is they did not get wiped out in the House. They don't have the majority, so there's not a lot to celebrate. But keeping the margin close puts them in position for the midterms. And last here, if you look at the individual House races, they have their 50 closest seats on here. And surprisingly, there's only two of them on here that are under one point margins. Both of them are going to be in California. The closest is going to be in the 45th. And apparently Derek Tran did come from behind and narrowly eke out a win over Michelle Steele. They had Steele winning it by a half a point. In the 22nd, David Valadeo won by a much wider margin than 0.7. So a lot of these calls they got right, but not in Washington's third. I also thought Joe Kent would pull that out. But in that rematch, it's going to go back to Luce and Camp Perez. So just like with anybody trying to predict every house seat, you're going to have some hits and you're definitely going to have some misses. You could point out any number of these if you'd like. Colorado's eighth, they had Caraveo winning it. That's one where I had a bold call and predicted Evans would come out on top. Turns out he did, but I had a bunch of other misses, such as in Alaska or Nebraska's second. I would never expect anybody to get every one of these right. There's a lot of guesswork here. The main thing you could do is try to guess the overall margin. And that one, they just slightly underestimated the Republicans, and apparently I got it exactly correct. So not terrible at all here from 538. It's not like 2016 where Trump came out of nowhere and did massive damage and it was an easy trifecta for the Republicans. That one pretty much blindsided everybody across the board, the entire polling industry, all the analysts, the pundits, etc. This should not be shocking for anyone that Trump was able to pull it out. I thought he would win it, but I would not have been shocked if Harris edged it out. I know we've all seen some of the terrible predictions out there that had Harris with gigantic landslides. Those I always thought were unreasonable, but it's definitely entertaining to take a look at those after the fact. So we'll see what 538 has in store for the midterms. But for now, let me know in the comments, what do you think about the 538 forecast? Do you think it's pretty solid with just a few misses? Do you think it's okay? You check it out once in a while, or do you think it's absolutely worthless? Let me know down below on your way out. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Join if you'd like to support the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.